croeso cynnes i chi gyd i'r cyntaf o'r cyfres yma o symposia a Raymond Williams uh, sydd yn cymryd lle eleni uh, yn y bethau ei ddathlu uh, gan rwyddiant. A warm welcome to you all to this first of a series of symposia arranged by uh, CRU, the Centre for Research into the Literature and Language of Wales, to mark the centenary of Raymond Williams's birth. In a recent piece in uh, the Times Literary Supplement, uh, Stefan Collini was noting that some thinkers seem to belong to their time, um, their ideas in some ways failing to retain their relevance and applicability after the moment of their, of their passing. Whereas other thinkers seem to have the capacity to speak uh, to different periods with new aspects of their works, perhaps, or things that are implicit in their writings becoming more apparent as times change. Williams died before the fall of the Berlin Wall and seemed perhaps in the years following his death to belong to the former group. Um, a lot of the writing perhaps in the 1990s seemed in retrospect somewhat perplexed at the status that he had accrued as the central figure of the intellectual left in Britain during his lifetime. But I think now in the year of his centenary, he belongs very much to the second category as someone who is being returned to um, by different kinds of constituencies in different parts of the world. And there have been events discussing Raymond Williams and his work taking place uh, all over the, uh, all over um, the world, in fact. Um, I've taken part myself in conferences at Hyderabad in India, uh, Campinas in Brazil, and my good friend Mariam Zhu just sent me pictures of a conference that took place in China last week dedicated to Raymond Williams and his work. So in his centenary year, Raymond Williams does indeed seem to speak to Wales and the world to draw on the title of a new collection of essays edited by uh, Steve Woodhams. So this is the first of a series of symposia that we've arranged over the next uh, couple of months. Uh, they, are they are accompanied by a website, perhaps we'll return to that during the day. Um, and I would like to uh, publicly acknowledge my thanks to Eve Johnson, a PhD student here at Swansea, uh, who's helped me with, to put these together and has designed the website. You'll have seen that the symposia take the form of uh, webinars. Uh, we've been advised to adopt this method as uh, it avoids gate crashing, uh, but also allows um, conversations to take place. So we use the Q&A facility at the bottom of the screen um, as attendees uh, to ask questions, um, but we'll also turn the chat function on uh, between papers for discussion and for sharing links uh, as well. You'll see that I've included some breaks in the program as uh, I'm aware, all too aware that Zoom fatigue uh, does become a factor as the day uh, goes on. You might be able to hear that my neighbors have decided to have the hedges trimmed this morning. Um, more significantly, the arrangements have been somewhat bedeviled by the pandemic. Uh, we were hoping to start these a bit earlier in the year, but even today, this morning, uh, my colleague Kirsty Bahata has sent me a note to say that she's actually suffering with COVID right now um, and has come out in a fever and won't be able to join us. So um, let me just wish Kirsty a full recovery. But we still have a packed few hours of fascinating papers, um, which will eventually, I hope, uh, go online and, and Kirsty can then record her paper and, and we'll add her in. So I'm delighted to say that Merrin Williams, um, Raymond Williams's daughter, a poet and a critic in her own right, uh, joins us this morning. Merrin has written on, on women modernists, on Thomas Hardy, on Wilfred Owen, among others, and is, has herself published several uh, volumes of poetry and edited collections of poetry. I'm very uh, grateful personally uh, for Merrin's support uh, over many years now. Uh, and it's my pleasure to invite you to say a few words now by way of opening 
the symposium, the symposia this morning, Merin. So uh, over, over to you. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me, Daniel. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to see you all, um, even though it has to be virtually. Uh, well, it seems incredible that my father was born 100 years ago, but I still get letters about him from all over the world. And I'd just like to tell you a little bit about where it all began in Pandu, where he was born on August the 31st, 1921. It was a very tiny village then. It didn't look like it does now. There was no housing estate. It was in the shadow of the skillet, and there were lots of little hills called the Tumps, where I used to play as a child. My grandfather, Harry Williams, um, who was born in 1896 into a farm labourer's family, but his, uh, the, the family lost their tied cottage. They were forced out to find work where they could. And Harry, who had a university level mind, left school at 12, as one did in those days. He's described on the 1911 census as a cowboy. That is, he was looking after cows on a farm. But he was ambitious. He left and became a boy quarter on the Great Western Railway. He was not quite 18 when the First World War broke out. And one day a lady got off the train and instead of giving him her luggage, gave him a white feather, which affected him deeply. He didn't want to join in the war. He never believed in it. And always said that he'd been conscripted, but in fact he jumped before he was pushed with the promise that he could have his job back if he survived. He was gassed um, and slightly wounded, but he did survive. And in 1919, married my grandmother, uh, Gwen, uh, who was born in Coalwall in the Malvern Hills. Her father was a bailiff for the great local family, and she herself worked with her mother in the dairy. So they moved to Pandy, where Harry was a signalman and also a, a sort of a, a great gardener in his spare time. Harry was very ambitious for his only son. He believed that education was the way to make something of yourself. Raymond won a scholarship to King Henry VIII's school in Abergavenny and was brought on very much, I think, by excellent teachers and by the local vicar, who was a scholarly man who never progressed beyond Pandy. Raymond was also brought up very much in the shadow of the war because Harry talked about it. Most men who been through the First World War didn't. Harry did talk about it. He talked about it to me when I was a small child. He felt that he'd been forced into it and that it must never happen again. Raymond's teacher, um, whom I never met, uh, Alan Rolfe, the Arthur Rolfe's, oh, I've got his name wrong. But Raymond's teacher was a remarkable man who got all his pupils to join the junior branch of the League of Nations. And Raymond got a scholarship, in fact, having won an essay competition to the League of Nations uh, Young People's Summer School in Geneva, which was a thrilling experience for him. He also got a railway warrant from his father and was able to travel all over England. So he had wider horizons than Pandy for a start. There were a few scholarships available in those days, uh, mostly for boys, to places like Oxford and Cambridge. The boys, the girls, I suppose, too, from state schools. And Raymond got one being brilliant. He went to Cambridge, which is where he met my mother, who'd been evacuated with other students from LSE. I think everyone knew then that the war was going to happen. And in spite of his pacifist background, both Raymond and his father realized that um, Nazism had to be stopped. He joined the OTC. He was also active in politics. Uh, he didn't get a very good degree during the first two years he was at Cambridge. That should, that should be an encouragement to some people. But he eventually had to leave and was in the Royal Artillery for the remainder of the war and took part not in the Normandy landings, not on the first day, but on D plus six, as it was called, as a tank officer and fought his way through Europe. He did, however, refuse when he was called up to go to Korea later on, he refused. Well, after he finally got out of the army, he returned to Cambridge and this time did brilliantly. He, uh, I think it's probably true he could have gone into academia, but what he wanted to do was teach in the Workers' Educational Association. So we lived on the south coast, first in Seaford and then on Hastings. And I was aware that uh, my father was not like other children's fathers. 
who went to work during the day and then came home. Uh, he went out most evenings during the week in an old van that they had on by train to various, uh, to various small towns in Sussex to teach WEA classes and also taught WEA summer schools in Oxford where we all worked for him. Sorry, I've dried up. <laughs> but during the day, during the day, instead of going, instead of going out to work, he shut himself in a little room and typed. One of my earliest memories is hearing the sound of this typewriter going behind the door. I, I, did, I did show him a word processor much later on, but he wasn't really very interested. He was used to, he was used to his old typewriter. Uh, and this is, how, uh, this is how culture and society eventually got written. And I began to realize for the first time, you know, that uh, people outside my family were interested in him. Well, that's all I will say, though, do ask me any questions you wish, because I know that so many other people uh, have got a lot they would like to contribute, and I would love to hear it. Oh, that's uh, lovely, Merrin, uh, setting the scene and, uh, well, taking us up to the moment, perhaps Raymond Williams becomes Raymond Williams in inverted commas, in a sense, you know, the public figure. Um, but of course, the, yeah, there was a, a long... Uh, background prior to that breakthrough with with culture and society um that of course um, Di smith has uh, documented in some detail in his biography uh, a warrior's uh, tale having completed that um biography merrin was kind enough um to allow the raymond williams papers which were um, at the disposal of, of uh, Di Smith as he was writing his work to be um, donated to us here at Swansea and they're held at the uh, Richard Burton archives here um, which in some ways is why it's appropriate that we're holding these symposia of course Swansea has been a, a sort of a hub for Raymond Williams studies ever since and that was in the mid 2000s so just to say a few words from the from the archives and to I uh, welcome you as well. I'd like to just um, call on Sean Williams, our, our head archivists at uh, Swansea University. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. And, uh, and hello, everybody. And thank you for asking me just to say a few words about the Raymond Williams collection, which is held in the Richard Burton archives at Swansea University. Um, we're very grateful to, to Merrin and family and also to Di Smith for facilitating um, the deposit of the papers back in 2007. Now, um, we were lucky enough to get some funding so we were able to catalogue the, the papers. Um, and they form part of the Welsh Writers in English group of, of papers that we have in the Richard Burton archives, along with others such as Ron Berry, Elaine Morgan and, and Alan Richards. But the Raymond Williams papers um, particularly are used extensively by researchers from all over the world. Um, and the papers show the full range of Raymond Williams's creativity and include manuscripts, typescripts, many of those that Merrin was just referring to on, on the typewriter. Um, also final versions of novels, dramatic works, poetry, academic writings. The collection also includes newspaper articles and reviews, professional um, correspondence with correspondents such as E.P. Thompson, Richard Hogan, um, Stuart Hall. Also um, personal and family papers, including his diaries and, and notebooks and also um, talks, lectures and debates. And, and the papers range in date from the 1940s up until the 1980s. If you'd like to find out a little bit more about um, what is in the collection, and also there are, um, we've digitized a very small um, selection of, of some of the papers. My colleague, Katrina Legg, has written a, um, a very fine introduction to the collection, which can be found by clicking on the Raymond Williams Collection at Swansea University link, which 
is on the Centenary Symposia website, which Daniel referred to earlier. Um, or you can find it by searching um, the Richard Burton Archives web pages. The archives is open to everybody. And as, as I said, we've already welcomed uh, researchers from all over the world, as well as um, the collections also used for, for learning and teaching for our own students and, and also um, students from other organisations as well. We welcome everybody to the, to the Richard Burton Archives. At the moment, due to COVID, our capacity is rather limited. So if you would like to visit, please do get in touch with us. Our details are on our website um, to make an appointment. And or we are very, very happy to deal with requests by email or, or you know, we can have Zoom discussions as well. But if anybody has any questions or would like to access the collection, please, please, please do get in touch with us. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Yes, let me re reiterate that um, the archives have been um, a vehicle in some ways for developing international connections um, and the symposia that follow this one uh, focused on the reception and uses made of Williams's ideas and work in Brazil and in Japan uh, have grown directly from uh, visits from scholars from those countries to, to the archives. Um, it, it is a great, a great resource. Um, Marion mentioned uh, Harry Williams, uh, her grandfather, Ray, Raymond's father, and uh, among the more moving things in the archive are Harry's own uh, diaries, which, which uh, um, well, document some of the things that Marion was, was describing and, and, uh, and many others, one of which is, um, Raymond on his 16th birthday being uh, woken by Harry, according to the diary, to listen to the Joe Lewis versus Tommy Farr fight from, uh, from New York. Um, I, I evoke that because um, <clears throat> in the process of um, preparing for the symposium and getting some responses from uh, Raymond Williams, I, I contacted the Henry Louis Gates at the Du Bois Institute in, in Harvard, who had been taught by Williams. And there's a letter from um, uh, Gates to Williams in the archive where Henry Louis Gates thanks uh, Williams for, his, um, for teaching him uh, and notes that some of your ideas have helped me to make sense of the experiences of um, blacks in the West is uh, Gates's phrase, a striking one. Um, the implications of which perhaps should be uh, explored. Um, it was Professor Gates then who told me of Phoebe Braithwaite's work, um, her PhD uh, that she's working on, on Stuart Hall, and suggested that I get in touch with Phoebe to ask her to speak um, on um, the relationship between um, Raymond Williams and uh, Stuart Hall, which is what I did, and which is why uh, Phoebe is with us uh, this morning. So um, a warm welcome to you. Um, Phoebe will be followed by, by Julian Priest, a colleague of mine at Swansea. Um, I'll introduce um, Julian after Phoebe's paper. Um, for this first session, then we'll, we'll listen to these uh, two papers um, first, um, and then uh, we'll open the, open the chat and see how the, the chat and question and answer uh, work um, and um, have, a, have a discussion on those pieces. Um, the session after that with, with Frian and, and Kirsty will have to be, um, I'll have to adapt that slightly, um, but let's enjoy the first uh, two papers uh, first. So let me pass on the reins then to, uh, to Phoebe, who I think wants to share the screen with us. A warm welcome to you, Phoebe. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, I will just share my screen. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real privilege and a pleasure to take part in this. Uh, uh, can you all see that? I've had issues with this in the past. Okay, I'm seeing this. So uh, as, as Daniel mentioned, this paper is about 
the relationship between Stuart Hall and Raymond Williams. And really, I, I suppose the thrust of it is to try and view Williams through the sort of uh, perspective of Stuart Hall. Um, and its title is Our Mongrel Selves, Stuart Hall and the Multiplicity of Raymond Williams. I never had the privilege of being taught by him, but he was the most formative intellectual influence on my life, Stuart Hall wrote in his New Statesman obituary of Raymond Williams in 1988. I often had the uncanny feeling that we had stumbled unawares onto the same line of thinking. This sense of something uncanny, somehow strange and deep and not answered simply by running through the facts of biography, often crops up in Hall's reflections on his relationships on his relationship with Williams. In an essay from 1993, which considers Williams' influence, Hall describes the shock of recognition. In an earlier essay appraising 1979's politics and letters, Hall rehearsed his sense of that supernaturally felt affinity, indicating his perception of a similarity with indifference that gives rise to the uneasy sense of kinship. He repeats his sense that he has often had the uncanny experience of beginning a line of thought or inquiry to find Williams had not only been traveling much the same road, but had given the issues a clearer, more forceful and clarifying formulation. During Williams's lifetime and afterwards, Hall leveled a variety of criticisms at Williams, both theoretical and political. In the wake of Paul Gilroy's influential 1987 critique, Hall sounded with Gilroy in naming the strategic silences in his work over questions of race and imperialism. And in a 1992 essay titled Our Mongrel Selves, asked against Williams' repeated emphasis on whole ways of communicating, which are always whole ways of life, whose way, whose life, one way or several. Despite these criticisms, the depth of that affinity remains. Hall has said that his intellectual and political life was formed and shaped in William's intellectual and political shadow. It's my purpose in this paper to tease out some points of confluence and departure, asking where that sense of the uncanny resided for Hall and how it is that despite his overt attachment to rooted communities, settled identities and relationships formed by long experience, Williams's writing selves remained open to mixture and rupture, conceiving of the human person not as some transcendent essence to be uncovered, but anticipating Hall as the confluence of many ways and roots. Hall discovers in Williams quite unexpectedly something like a diasporic consciousness, complicating the Welsh, English or borderlands portrait more often given of, as Williams once put it, Raymond Williams by border country. Stuart Hall was not, moreover, alone in navigating a relationship with Williams that entailed substantive critique alongside evident debt. Edward Said, Cornel West, Juliet Mitchell, Gail Lewis, and Paul Gilroy are but some of the thinkers who have criticized Williams while remaining committed to the intellectual and political projects in which his influence has been signal. By focusing on what Hall found so fertile in Williams's work and mode, I consider where it is that others have gone on thinking with Williams, even where they find him falling short. As Jilly Boyce K notes in a, a recent essay, his example runs in the bloodstream of cultural studies and his work has been used as a generative model for theorizing culture in contexts beyond his own. What qualities, uh, I want to ask today, have made it so ripe for grafting and what prompts this sympathy even amid dissent? So to begin, Hall often associated Williams with the dialogical, a, qu a quality of being in dialogue, of being in the presence of other points of view. Its etymological root is a speaking through, one, one might say a speaking through difference. Hall wrote of Williams's dialogical voice in his 1983 lecture, Culturalism, and earlier wrote that the interview format of politics and letters, quote, gives a quite exemplary demonstration of this dialogic quality of mind. This, this quality is bound up for Hall with an experience of rupture or removal from the scene of one's formation. And it is in the correspondence between the dialogical and the dislocated that he seems to find the affinity. He writes, the shock of moving from a Welsh border town to the environs of Oxbridge could only have been experienced as a kind of subjective rupture. This rupture, he goes on, is not unlike the experience of migration. The double negative here, not unlike migration, 
alerts us to a pressure of articulation, a force exerted to get the comparison right and perhaps to control the emotions at work. Williams recalled of arriving at Cambridge, I was wholly unprepared for it. I knew nothing about it. Those stark sentences, Hall writes, carried enormous reverberations for me. In addition, Hall often quite curiously associates Williams with W.E.B. Du Bois's concept of double consciousness, either by way of repudiation or explication. It is as though he is on the one hand, struggling with the uncanny feeling that this man from Pandy merely 10 years older than him, who was something like a father figure, he, he wrote in his, in his memoir, might offer him some way through the racializing experience of arriving as a West Indian immigrant at Oxford in 1951. On the other hand, it is as, as though he's ascribing something of this split psyche, the result of the pain endured by those subjected to the logic of assimilation to Williams himself. Twice in Hall's writing when discussing Williams, double consciousness crops up. Um, and it's not a, a concept that Hall uses all that often. So I thought, I thought it was striking. In one of these instances, uh, taking Williams to task for his emphasis on actual and sustained relationships, Hall is at pains to remind Williams that double consciousness does not belong to the Western nomadic subject, no matter, matter how many complex borderlines they might have crossed. It belongs to those who find themselves thrust into that world. The burden of double consciousness, Hall writes, was the burden not of the master, but of the slave and his or her descendants people who find themselves in the West, but are not of it. He rests the concept back as if it had been Williams to begin with. Crossing these complex borderlines, nevertheless has psychological and stylistic ramifications. It makes you as Hall writes, instantly alive to the forms and patterns which have shaped you and which you have left behind intellectually at the very least for good. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Raymond Williams and Frank Commode in 1981, I believe. Uh, in Williams, aliveness to those patterns, shapes and forms finds expression in an almost limitless attunement to complexity and exactness, the famed self-qualification of his style, alongside a capacity for seemingly transparent autobiographical reflection amid theoretical density. Uh, a quality which Lola Seaton has termed autobiographical pressure, E.P. Thompson called the uniting pressure and Williams himself this personal pressure and commitment. This double capacity, both external and internal, is borne by Williams's deliberate length, with its stress on long experience, the slow reach again for control or what has been termed as gripping slowness. We encounter, for, it, for instance, in William's seminal essay, Culture is Ordinary, a tensile modulation between analysis and experience. This oscillation lends his insight force, seeming to render it more than analytic. Describing the bus journey from Pandy to Cambridge, Williams writes with rousing simplicity of the culture from which he has migrated. I speak in a different idiom, but I think of these same things. Here, the sentence's balance communicates poise amid loss. It holds together two things neither made equivalent nor to cancel one another out. This sense of difference harnessed within the singular entity is what Hall calls uncanny. It gives a jolt. What was once familiar is now strange. This experience, Hall writes, of oneself as, as both subject and object, of encountering oneself from the outside as another and other is uncanny. He associates the self-reflexivity of the intellectual life with the dialogical and the diasporic. Williams was propelled by this rupture into a zone of greater self-determination. Hall wrote of Williams that he, was remark he has a remarkable ability to treat himself and his own work dispassionately from the outside, as it were, without losing his line or his characteristic voice. Here, identity becomes a construction a theorizable thing thoroughly altered through its availability for theorization. I cannot become identical with myself, Paul wrote in, uh, or rather said in this lecture of which there's a screenshot um, in 2007, reflecting on the unavoidable contradiction between identity as it is thought and experienced. Where Williams is remarkable from his different standpoint in anticipating its path of fragmentation. In the long revolution, 
Williams writes of the transition in cultural understandings of the individual and by extension of identity from that imminent sense of what I am to what I want to be and what by my own efforts I have become. Here the elaboration of possible what eyes opens up that singularity to possibility and permutation. When in border country, Matthew discusses his migration from Glamour with Arthur Pugh, he says his father has no understanding of the break because it is outside his experience. Pugh responds that it's never a choice between the letter and the spirit, resisting the binary distinction between lives of thought and action. A life lasts longer than the actual body through which it moves, Pugh says. This carries William's typical emphasis on rooted communities and lives which bear forwards the energy of social reproduction, but it is also charged over and above this through the figure of Matthew with a sense of his identity's futurity and openness to change. In Williams, we encounter an unwillingness to resolve multiplicity difference and incommensurability into a single transcendent unit, even where that temptation arises. The dialogical opposes the dialectical in that it does not synthesize its constituent elements, but lets them coexist in all their mutual complexity. Williams' work entails consistent modulation between fixity and change. Amid an emphasis on totality, Williams is wedded to militant particularism. He holds these things in tension. I speak in a different idiom, but I think of these same things. The persistent recursion in Williams' work to the unitary, the gestalt, is married with a commitment to reflect the world in all its particularity that reaches its fullest expression in the swivel-eyed realism of his novels. Thus, the oneness of totality or knowable communities stand for irreducible complexity, real universalities, singular communities comprised, comprised of people in all their plenitude. Stuart Hall puts his finger on this seemingly contradictory quality when he discusses Williams in Familiar Stranger, so different from Edward Thompson, who grew madder and wilder as he became more animated by saying, the more excited Raymond became, the quieter he grew. He dropped into a sort of Welsh burr and you had to listen very carefully to hear what was being scrupulously formulated. In Williams's writings, that sense of two things held in tension is ever apparent even within the titles of the critical works, which invariably operate on the model of two, contrasting a kind of quietude with some altogether messier counterpart, country and cities, culture and society, Marxism and literature. Of those two latter traditions, Williams is clear, there was much that one had to learn from the other, for the Marxist interpretation of culture contained the unitary directive to write, think, learn in certain prescribed ways, while the Leverside tradition had much to learn from Marxism about all of modern English society and its immediate history. This sense of mutual interpenetration is at the heart of the Williams project and gives rise to, some, to the sensation that some third thing, as Henry Louis Gates Jr. remarks about Du Bois's Souls of Black Folk, is often lingering just out of sight. In Border Country, Matthew Price bears the trace of this unresolved duality. Known by his official name, Matthew, in London, he becomes will again when returning to Wales, replete with its suggestion of being restored to possession of his will and full human agency. This idea, its comment on alienation, is lent resonance by Mrs. Hybart seeing Matthew or Harry return, uh, or um, not Harry, um, uh, Will, sorry, return from the city to attend to his ailing father and noting that she felt it necessary to call him Mr. Price since he fled home. You hear and I can see you, your will again. You away, it's different, it's just an idea. Williams's protagonist is, to borrow from Hall's lexicon, a bearer of double consciousness, a Janus-faced figure. This is made explicit by Williams when narrating the agonized process of his naming, one option the avatar of familial inheritance, while the other is a chosen title without worldly attachment. Ellen, for a boy, wanted Will, which had been her father's name. Harry wanted Matthew, though only he knew why, for it was not a name that meant anything in either family, Williams writes. In this way, Williams dramatizes and subverts the English hegemonic attitude towards Wales as a singular other to show, as Daniel Williams argues, that it is on the Welsh side of the border that identities become unstable. <clears throat> the structure of feeling emblematizes Williams' typical modulation between these units of thought, its blend of hard and soft, schematic and amorphous, analytic, Latinate and felt Anglo-Saxon, rehearses the conflict between the one and the many so as to hold them in tension. Hall returns to what he calls Williams's characteristically or oxymoronic formulation frequently. 
And yet it also presents a fundamental point of departure for Hall, for whom it's, quote, unsatisfactory organicists stressed, entailed a refusal to inspect, ex inspect experience with full theoretical intelligence, a refusal born out of a feeling for the sanctity of that experience's plenitude, which thereby presents its elements as possessing a simultaneity of causal power. I've been attempting to show how, in some way not perhaps fully self-conscious, Williams anticipates and stimulates some of Hall's thinking about identity and diaspora, despite differences. When Hall and his collaborators announced at the end of 1978's Policing the Crisis that, quote, race is the modality in which class is lived, the medium in which class relations are experienced, we hear the residue of that negotiation with Williams in which Hall deciphered the experience of class translation, transition and rupture, where he says, the contrast between these two cultural experiences he's talking about Williams here, it's not unlike the experience of migration from one class to another, from one town to another, from the country to the city, or from the periphery to the center. Finally, I would like to turn to the question of Williams's voice. In a 1978 essay published in the New Left Review, Problems of Materialism, Williams writes that the material process of the production of art includes certain biological processes of the body and of the voice, which are not a mere substratum, but are at times the most powerful elements of the work. It is striking when considering evaluations of Williams, how often it is this voice which has made claims on interlocutors. Terry Eagleton has described it as unmistakably individual, the discourse of a complex guarded self-display while Daniel Hartley attends to its self-renewing subclauses. In his monograph, Stuart Hall's Voice, David Scott argues that a complete intellectual and, in and ethical posture resides in the quality of Hall's voice. He calls this an ethics of receptive generosity, a conversational voice attuned to listening as much as to speaking, which is unusual in being less about the arrival at truth than about the endless recursive process of provisional clarification. We value this work, he suggests, not so much for the positions it elaborates as for the manner in which it elaborates them. As Williams himself wrote about the style of Edmund Burke, it is a personal experience become a landmark. Scott points up a signal continuity between Williams and Hall. One measure of that voice's ambient influence can be found in the readiness with which its coinages have been taken up by others, often without awareness of attribution. As Lindsay Hanley uh, remarks, the phrase, the slow cancellation of the future has been attributed to Mark Fisher and to Bifo Baradi, but it was in fact Williams who first used the phrase in 1960. The slow and shocking cancellation of the future is what border countries Morgan feels in the aftermath of the 1926 general strike. Across Williams's afterlives, the depth of the criticism can be seen to correspond to the depth of the debt. Those who have crit critiqued Williams have done so in nearly every instance in a spirit of extending his work and analysis into those domains where it fell short. They do so in my reading, not in the spirit of recrimination, uh, so much as through what Phil O'Brien describes as a frustrated attachment, naming Williams's relation to Marx. Edward Said's Orientalism owes its deep debt to the complex navigation of the country and the city's binary construct, and Said has described Williams and his body of work as optimistic, hopeful, gentle, and large. Paul Gilroy, a few pages before the critique in There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack, describes his object of study as the structures of racial feeling. In a recent interview, Gilroy describes Williams as an extraordinary thinker. Two sentences later, he describes Williams' work as a resource of hope. Williams's dialogical cadence and program of restrained self-revelation are indeed inscribed across Hall's work. In his 1973 lecture, Sociology and Literature, Williams takes aim at the exclusionary framework of Cambridge English by asking a crescendo of questions about who determines literary value. Which people, in what social relationships, with each other and with others, he asks. We hear the sound of this spirited cross-examination, perhaps, ringing through in Hall's words when he puts his own questions to Williams. Whose way, whose life, one way or several? 
While it seems beyond the scope of this paper to respond in detail to the points raised by Gilroy Hall and others, these echoes add to that picture of frustrated attachment. In the essay with which I began, our Mongol selves, Stuart Hall quotes from Salman Rushdie in announcing his allegiance with the diasporic peoples of the world. The satanic verses, Rushdie says, rejoices in mongolization and fears the absolutism of the pure. Melange, hotchpotch, a bit of this and that is our newness enters the world. It is a love song to our Mongol selves. Hall notes in that essay that Williams understood the essentially mythic and constructed discourse of essential cultural continuity and quotes from his 1983 essay, Wales and England, where Williams describes the quote, mongrel mark of Anglo-Welsh into cultural diffusion, stressing the great complexity at the heart of cultural mixture and exchange. Its complex process, Williams writes, is in fact always being remade and reinterpreted. It is this mixed and uneven process which is the true and complex cultural identity of Wales. Distilling ideal qualities, he writes, from the forced compound is not just wrong, but hostile. Um, and I just wanted to end really on a postscript, um, which is to say that doing this research, it was difficult to find much about Williams's views of Hall going in the other direction. And a couple of years ago, I was in the Stuart Hall archive in Birmingham and found this, um, this little note card that Raymond Williams had sent him uh, praising policing the crisis. Um, and it's typed out there uh, where he praises it and, and seems to want to discuss two of its later chapters. Um, and I, I suppose just to say that I, you know, I would love to hear if, if anybody has any leads on, on where those impressions can be kept or any other points that they'd like to make. Thank you. Thank you, Phoebe. That's a very rich paper in all kinds of ways. Um, uh, raising a whole host of, of issues that I'm sure will we'll link up with some of the other things we discuss uh, during the day um, as, as well. Uh, I think one, one answer to your last question is probably the, the archives that we have here um, and the correspondence between Williams and, uh, and Hall. Um, yeah, yeah um, I, 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 I won't try and foreclose future questions that people might have to ask you, but, but just that in the introduction to... Um, the Hall Du Bois lectures, Henry Louis Gates expresses his shock that Raymond Williams never mentioned to him that Stuart Hall was was black. Um, yeah. Given that Hall was, you know, interested in, um, well, the co concepts of identity is precisely the things that um, that Gates was 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 interested in himself. Um, mm. it, it it just just thinking of Williams. I mean, Williams starts to mention Hall. From the late fifties, you know, there there are pieces where he talks about um, collaborating with, with this intellectual with, with roots, roots in Jamaica. Uh, some of the pieces in in Border, um, well, the collection called Border Country about Raymond Williams's um, early educational work includes some some of that. By the late sixties, Hall is is now running the the centre in Birmingham. Um, so so thinking of it from Raymond Williams's perspective, perhaps he'd be surprised that Henry Louis Gates didn't already know who Stuart Hall was. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, by then, with, with the 1970s, that, that's what just struck me read, reading that. Yeah, I think um, Hall really became famous in the States much later on, and it was very much linked to the kind of explicit thinking about identity he was doing during the 80s and 90s. Um, so yeah. It, uh, perhaps he should have, have known, <laughs> given that he was in England and um, and Hall was already a bit of a household name. Um, I think it's just that those two academic cultures are oddly estranged from each other in in some ways. Yeah, it's a revealing moment in in, in that respect. I think maybe not not so much should have known, but but it wouldn't have been unusual maybe for Raymond Williams to think that he, that he knew. Um, knew. Um, any, anyway. That's 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 great, and we will pursue some of those ideas. You know, the the, the yeah the, the placing of of Raymond Williams, if you like, um, but by Hall in relation to the questions of identity is just something that's developed over the last twenty years or so in thinking about Raymond Williams's work, but certainly wasn't the case 
um, when well, when say Williams and Hall collaborated on the May Day Manifesto and so forth. Mm. Um, we'll have a discussion, I think, about both uh, both papers. So let me just uh, draw on uh, Julia now, and thank you very warmly for that again, uh, Phoebe. Um, Julian Priest is a, is a colleague of mine, as I said, and has written uh, widely um, on Gunter Grass, on, on Kafka. Um, more recently, we've, we've uh, collaborated together on multilingual literatures. Um, last, uh, was it last year or two years ago now, it, the International Perspectives on Multilingual Literatures volume uh, appeared under uh, Julian's editorship with um, Kate Jones and, and Aled Rees uh, contributing to, to that uh, fine volume. And um, Julian and I co-supervised um, a very fine um, PhD by Dan Gerke on um, Raymond Williams and European Marxism, which I hope will uh, appear in print fairly soon. Dan has been unwell, uh, another victim of the pandemic uh, year and um, couldn't, uh, join us today, but um, having worked on, on Williams together, um, Julian is going to talk about a, a connection that I wasn't um, aware of, a connection of a different kind to that with, with Stuart Hall, um, Raymond Williams and Elias Canetti. So um, Julian, welcome to the conference. Uh, thank you, Dan. Um, thank you for that uh, introduction. It's always a pleasure to work as I ha have occasionally been able to do with the uh, Richard Burton Archive and um, the authors associated uh, with it. Um, I'd like to say thank you for Phoebe for such an excellent start. I don't think I'm going to quite uh, live up to uh, that standard, but um, I have some interesting things to say nevertheless. Um, I'd like to say also a special welcome to uh, Paula Church, who's writing uh, a, a project on Elias Canetti and Iris Murdoch. And uh, I hope you'll chip in, Paula, if uh, anything occurs to you uh, in the chat. and. Um, and also to uh, Katie Jones, whose name has just been uh, mentioned. I was hoping you would come and indeed you have. So um, I'm going to just read my paper out and um, I hope that works. I haven't prepared any uh, slides. <clears throat> Elise Canetti was a third language German speaker born in 1905 in the Bulgarian city of Rusch or Rushchuk near the mouth of the river Danube. He died in Zurich in 1994 after living also in Manchester, Vienna, Frankfurt, and London. Over the course of some 60 years, he published three plays, various volumes of aphorisms, what he called jottings or notes, Aufzeichnungen, one novel, one travelogue about a journey to Marrakesh accompanying a film crew in 1953, a difficult to classify volume known under the rather prosaic title of Crowds and Power, a book of character sketches entitled The Ear Witness, and a three volume autobiography. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1981 after receiving praise from Susan Zontag in the New York Review of Books. With his immediate family and his wife Vesa, he spoke Ladino, a Jewish language which has a similar relationship to Spanish that Yiddish does to German. It was used by Sephardis from a term for Spain or Spanish, descended, descendants of those Jews expelled from Spain after the Catholic reconquest in 1492 whose ancestors relocated to parts of North Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast, Southeastern Europe under the control of the Ottomans, and for that reason called themselves Turks. His parents spoke German to each other, which he could not at the time understand. His father died suddenly when he was eight years old while the family was living in Manchester, and which he called a secret language. Rustchuk has been part, had been part of the Ottoman Empire in living memory, Beza Canetti's parents came from formerly Ottoman Serbia. In Vienna in the 1930s, they translated the American socialist author Upton Sinclair, that is, Elias got the commission, and his name appears in the books, but Vesa is reckoned to have done the actual work. This is how literary partnerships between the sexes often worked in those days. Vesa is believed by some to have translated John Cooper Powers's novel, Wolf Solent. The name translator is Richard Hoffman, who was the owner of the translation agency where Vesa freelanced. With her possible assistance, as is again strongly believed in some quarters, Elias also wrote the novel entitled Die Blendung, literally The Blinding, which would come out in English after the war in Britain as Auto da Fe and in North America following the French 
as the Tower of Babel in a translation by the historian of the Thirty Years' War, C.V. Wedgwood. The Blendung is about psychotically dysfunctional characters, trauma, sexual abuse, crazed bibliophilia, misogyny, anti-Semitism, and general civilizational collapse. The leading character is an independent scholar of Chinese whose expert knowledge of his subject has rendered him incapable of understanding the world he lives in. The act of faith or out of da fe is a fire which consumes both him and his library at the end of the novel. Raymond Williams draws attention to two characters, the Jewish hunchback Fischerly, whom Canetti presents in Out of da Fe as an amalgam of anti-Semitic stereotypes, and the housekeeper turned wife, Teresa Krumholtz. Fischerly, for example, hides under the bed while his wife has sex with other men for money and is obsessed with becoming a world champion chess player. This is the kind of thing that anti-Semites say about Jews is what Canetti is trying to show. Teresa Krumholz is a rapacious Philistine who marries the central character, the sinologist Peter Keen. Canetti had a doctorate in chemistry, but succeeded in avoiding regular paid employment all his life, relying on family members, rich friends, or his wife to support him financially. They often lived in poverty, but were convinced of his own greatness as a writer and thinker. After forced re-emigration to England in, England in December 1938, in the wake of increased Nazi persecution of Jews in annexed Austria, he set out to find a place in British literary and cultural life while working in German on his magnum opus. This would be published as Masse und Macht in 1960 with an English translation, Crowds and Power, following two years later. Some of Kennedy's experiences in London amongst British writers and intellectuals are recorded in a posthumously posthumously published memoir, Party in the Blitz. He has a section here on varieties of arrogance among the English. And it turns out that contrary to continental usage, he does have the English in mind rather than the British. Some of his comments, which Raymond Williams knew nothing about, I hope are of interest to this audience and may be relevant to my theme. For example, he writes, what would England be without the inf influx from Ireland? The Irish entered the country the whole time as they did the USA. Without them, England would have lost heart, the people of victory that used to be able to count on the Welsh too. Kennedy hates T.S. Eliot in every way imaginable for his poetry, his persona, his place and influence in literary life, and sees Dylan Thomas as his opposite. Kennedy could be a great hater, which is one of his virtues. In late 1944, at a literary evening in honor of a visitor from the French resistance, Eliot and Thomas both read from their poetry. Under arrogance on Thomas, Canetti writes in Party in the Blitz, but he was a Welshman and a poet, a poet out of riches, not out of poverty like Eliot. I never felt he was arrogant. And in his notebook, he says, he was free of arrogance, which is the national disease of the English. And for that reason, he was a poet. Under Iris, Iris Murdoch, you can't call her arrogant in the English sense either. She has Irish heritage. Kennedy was romantically involved with Murdoch at the beginning of her literary career, continuing to see her and exchange letters for the next four decades. According to her biography, Peter Conradi, her biographer, Peter Conradi, she based a succession of Svengali-like power figures on him, sometimes with Central European provenance. In her diary, she exoticized him. Another lover, literary pupil and fellow refugee Friedel Benedict, also known as Anna Sebastian, was an habitué of Fritz Rove, Fitz Rovier in the war years and mentions running into Thomas in her diary. As I discovered recently from some unpublished jottings now made available online, Canetti also spent an evening in the pub with Dylan Thomas. After hearing of his death, Canetti recalls this occasion, comparing Thomas's appearance to that of Franz Werfel which should probably not be taken as a compliment, and his liking of alcohol to that of another Austrian Jewish writer, Joseph Rort, whom Kometi had met in Paris. He was delicate, he was round and delicate and weak, and his whole strength lay in the few illuminating words of his poems. I love them as I love Trakel, but I do not yet know them enough. On the evening they met, Thomas was not conspicuous by his knowledge of anything in particular, and I was ashamed of my head stuffed with junk. Then they discussed out of da fe. Th Thomas claimed to have read the novel in Tehran. Canetti's first note on him refers to his 
Persian lies about me, indicating that he did not initially believe the Tehran connection. John Davenport, Thomas's friend with whom he wrote uh, a book called The Death of the King's Canary, endorsed a paperback edition of Outer Fe, however, in the mid-1960s. Thomas seems to have become obsessed with Fischerly. At this point in his career, approaching 50 and something of a one-book wonder, Canetti is certainly hungry for recognition. He writes, it was obvious that Dylan Thomas had been obsessed for months with the characters in Outer Fe. He complained that he could think of nothing else and, felt, and I felt honored by his words. Although he was a lot younger than me, the greatest honor that had befallen me in England and the principle, the only one which has meant anything to me up to the present day. But it seemed to me too that he expected me to be different and was disappointed by me. I was disappointed by something too. His memory of Friedel seemed to me to be rather indifferent and without color. There was thus a mutual connection followed by a shared frustration or hesitancy to take the acquaintance further. Raymond Williams knew Canetti only through his novel, but discovered similarly that his interest uh, in it reached a limit. Canetti was not the only Jewish emigre who knew Thomas or Thomas's work. After his death, the Vienna-born Erich Fried was commissioned to translate Under Milk Wood, which he was supposed to do in a single week. According to my emeritus colleague in Cardiff, Gerrit Jan Berens, Sir Thomas mixed languages in a way that Fried, who wrote German while living in Kilburn and working for the BBC, became determined to avoid. There are various other connections between Canetti and the Welsh. By the mid 1960s, the Welsh speaking professor of German at Manchester University, Idris Parry, became Canetti's advocate in academia, writing influential essays and a string of reviews in the Times Literary Supplement, which at that time were unsigned. But you can tell who they're by uh, on the online uh, electronic archive nowadays. Canetti and uh, Parry visited each other and exchanged numerous letters, of which Canetti's are now published. In the first, Canetti was impressed by his understanding of Die Blendung and took time to answer his questions. There is an element of strategy here, but not just that. There were mutual visits in Ham Hampstead and Manchester. Parry reported on a visit that he made with his wife Erwin to John Cooper Powys. It inspired in Canetti the wish to come with them if they went again. But, Canet but Powys died in June 1963, the month, uh, incidentally, after Weser. Canetti does not mention Weser's involvement with the German translation of Wolf Solent, which his critics, who blame him for standing in the way of her receiving credit for her work, would say is typical. In the third published letter to Parry, Canetti addresses him by his first name and writes in English, which has been in the language of their conversations. I think I told you that the fortnight I spent in Wales in 1947 made a far deeper impression on me than anything else I experienced since my return to this country. Can you imagine what it meant to me now to be received in your home, to meet your wife, who seems to me the noblest essence of everything that is Welsh, to listen to the talk in your language you had taped? I could have listened to it 20 times, to watch your daughters a little, to hear you call each other by these magical names, and on top of it all to get to know you yourself better. Canetti liked visiting Manchester because he had spent two years of his childhood in South Didsbury, and they took him back there. After his second visit, he writes, I very much liked your friends, the Krugers, their amazing hospitality and their memories of Japan. It won't be difficult for you to imagine how curious this German-Japanese experience was for me. I think it was so memorable because you both took me there. And as I owe you the experience of Wales and the rebirth of my childhood in Manchester, there was this sudden confrontation of Wales, Manchester, Germany, and Japan. A whole novel, really, which I, I wish I was better qualified to write. One might say that this novel was, in the end, written as Austerlitz, Austerlitz by W.G. Zebart, who must have taught with Parry in Manchester and knew and wrote about Kennedy. In his final letter to Parry in 1985, Canetti calls Welsh a magical language, which he curses himself for not having learned. He advised uh, Fritz Arnold, the German translator of an essay by Parry on, his, on Canetti's work, concluding that, your text reads well, in spite of the twists in the original, which in English are not without attraction, as there is something Welsh to them. Valisicious, for some reason, is in inverted commas. Canetti gradually established a reputation in the German-speaking world after the publication of Masso und Macht. Up to then, Auto da Fe was better known than Die Blendung. 
After being taken on by the renowned German and Austrian Hansa publishing house in 1962, Canetti had advised his new editor about his literary career hitherto in English translation. He's then, he then says this about the reviews of the paperback reissue of Auto da Fe. I'm sending you the Observer, Sunday Telegraph, Spectator, and by far the most interesting, the essay by Raymond Williams, who has repeatedly written about Auto da Fe for years, referring to the novel in all his books with great respect. All his books is an exaggeration, but was true up until the publication of Culture and Society in 1958. The essay in question is called A Note by Williams and entitled Fiction and Delusion. It was published in the review section of the New Left Review earlier that year, May, June, 1962. Williams did indeed allude to the novel in his first two books, Reading and Criticism from 1950 and Drama from Ibsen to Eliot, 1952. In chapter three of Reading and Criticism, which is a kind of textbook for teachers of literature, his subject, his subject is critics and criticism, by which essentially he means the practice of reviewing novels. He begins with a section on cliches found in reviews and the use to which they are put by publishers in promotional material. The next section of the chapter is about Out of Fe, which is the only literary work translated from another language to which he devotes any attention in the book, saying that, on considered judgment, I would put it among a small list. There are five or six names of great novels published in English since 1918. Williams then reviews the reviews and finds only one which he deems honest in terms of methodology and assessment. He tears the others apart, quoting apparently contradictory or redundant commentary and concluding rather huffily that none of this can be considered, can seriously be considered criticism before getting back to more familiar terrain and spending the rest of the chapter in the company of Wolfe, Orwell and Lawrence. Reviewing the reviews is the first stage in writing reception history and Williams is clearly puzzled by what the London-based literary press made of Canetti's novel, which overwhelmingly it welcomed. Writing in the next but one issue of New Left Review, Tom Nairn studies the British reactionary British reaction to Kennedy's next book, Crowds and Power, Mass und Macht, and concluded that in praising such an alien work of philosophical cultural criticism, which Nairn insisted was itself phony, the reviewers were confirming their own know-nothing insularity. Nairn regards Crowds and Power as a work of historical sociology, and he finds it understandably lacking. But why is it that he is so exercised by its impact on the British intelligentsia? Neither Nairn nor Williams, nor indeed the New Left Review, ever mentioned Kennedy again, as far as I'm aware. In Williams' next and better known book, Drama from Ibsen to Eliot, which would be reissued as Drama from Ibsen to Brecht, his basic premise is that since the mid 18th century, in the words of George Bernard Shaw, whom he quotes, the English novel has been one of the glories of literature, whilst the English drama has been its disgrace. Williams consequently has chapters on Strindberg, Chekhov, Pirandello, Anui, Hauptmann and Toller, Shaw, Yeats and Singh, whom he calls the most remarkable English speaking prose dramatist of the century, by the way. These are all literary imports, three Irish, two Scandinavians, two Germans, an Italian and a Frenchman. Williams mentions Canetti twice in the Ibsen chapter, which is by some margin his longest. The first time is in connection with the hero's self-defeating quest in Pier Gint, in which he is steadily moving away from that which he wishes to find. In seeking, he is hiding. His, ro his straight road is the roundabout of the bog. His eye is scratched by the trolls. His vision is blindness. In a footnote, he compares Pier Gint to Peter Keane in Out of the Fe and draws attention to that brilliant exposition of fantasy to which the German title, Die Blendung, refers. Later, Williams calls Hedda Gabler a savage farce, which is traditionally difficult to distinguish from melodrama. Mr. Eliot's example in this genre was Marlowe's Dew of Malta. From contemporary literature, one might add Canetti's Auto da Fe. Canetti's novel is by now a fixed point of reference in the context of reviewers claiming that they liked it but not being able to articulate why, self-inflicted delusion and farce tipping over into melodrama. In the New Left Review, Williams is typically confessional, 
reflecting in the first person, as was his wont, and in ways our students are usually advised not to do. On how he reacted to the novel in 1946, trying to understand that reaction and finding it mainly repeated in 1962. He finds the first two thirds of the novel still more convincing than the last third and explains how each figure interprets their apprehension of others and the world through their own obsessions, a technique which derives ultimately from Cervantes' Don Quixote, I would say. While the two most memorable characters are the equally grotesque and repellent Fischerly and Teresa, he praises the novel's essential humanity, which he finds superior to much recent English fiction. At least in the first half of the book, the whole perception of human beings made ugly and ridiculous by exposure to a reality to which they are inadequate is essentially humane in its actual effect. This is mainly because they are not held up to ridicule against some supposed norm of pleasant and adequate people, or as more commonly in recent English fiction, against the norm of a hero who is himself inadequate, but who has rationalized this into a brash self-acceptance which comes through finally as complacency. If Canetti disliked English arrogance, Williams here pinpoints complacency. And what he admires in Canetti's novel is the refusal to accept the world and the people in it as they are. In the 1930s, when Canetti wrote Die Blendung, he was on the left, which is how he got the commission to translate Upton Sinclair, which funded uh, the writing of the novel. Williams then finds problems. I see looking back from this new reading that it raises issues which were then unconscious and which I have since written about. For example, the conflict of ideas of the individual and the masses in the chapter A Madhouse. I find more to interest me in this final part than I did then, but either it is an imaginative world I have not yet fully assimilated or the control of the writer so clear in the earlier parts has in fact declined. I can't settle this question and must merely record my uncertainty. The chapter, A Madhouse, contains the germ of the uh, idea for crowds and power, Hamas und Macht. Here, he equates the crowd in, the, in a madhouse, that is, with instinctual aggression, which the civilized individual usually holds in check. And when they can do that no longer, and the crowd individu and in the individual finds no satisfaction, the individuals develop psychosis which is how they end up in a madhouse. Another way of distinguishing the two halves of the novel, um, which uh, the, the, the first two thirds, which Williams likes the more, and the, third, uh, the final third, which he likes less, is to point out that Auto de Fe becomes, becomes less and less realist. A madhouse, which is towards the end, also features a man who lives as if he were a gorilla and for which there is no immediate socio-political explanation. By the end of the 1960s, Canetti was being championed in the English speaking world in the United States as a Jewish author from Central or Eastern Europe, rather than as a modernist who expressed alienation. He never published another work of fiction. In Britain, he could no longer rely on getting reviewed at all. Williams, meanwhile, found other writers and thinkers from the European mainland to stimulate his own work. And that is how I am concluding. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Julian. I mean, that's, um, well, a very rich context and an unusual one uh, or a new one to me in which to place Williams. Um, his own description of himself as a Welsh European is one that he makes in politics and letters in 1979. And I think that's usually seen to reflect the true, uh, the two sort of slightly divergent trajectories that his thought takes in the 70s. On, on the one hand, engaging more with the particularities of uh, Welsh politics and culture. So that's when he starts to write on the Welsh industrial novel and so forth. And at the same time, his more overt engagement with European Marxist thought, which um, is really coming through in the English language world from the late 60s onwards. So it's interesting to think about his European formation as being much earlier than that. Um, as a consciousness that he has prior, he talks, I think, about 
himself as a student in Cambridge, being primarily interested in, Euro in European modernism. Um, so, well, well, that's really where our collaboration started. Um, I, I was um, suspicious that um, Williams would have uh, written lots of reviews of, uh, of uh, translated fiction, of translated uh, uh, thinkers, and um, a visit to the archive uh, confirmed that suspicion. And um, I haven't yet followed that up properly. I, I must eventually uh, do so. So. Yeah, and the, re the reference back to the earlier works as well was, was very useful, Ju Julian. So we've, we've in between the two papers, we have two very different contexts for, for Williams, right? Uh, the one in some ways debates on, on, on race and identity, um, hybridity, diaspora in relation to, to Phoebe, some of those themes picked up by yourself, Julian. I mean, Idris Parry in Manchester is a figure not wholly unlike Williams because we tend to think in British terms you know, we don't think of Welsh speaking academics in English universities as being in any sense diasporic or unhomed. Um, but the experience of, of uh, studying or, or working in England often is experienced by that, by especially Welsh speakers, I think. Um, although they're, you know, obviously completely fluent in other languages, including English uh, as well. Um, so um, let me open things up. The um, there's the question and answer uh, option that our attendees can, can use. Um, I think there's a way of allowing the chat to work as well if, if um, people would prefer to use that. But do we, do we have questions for our uh, two, two speakers? For those, for those who are panelists, you can actually speak. <laughs> So those on the screen can actually press the microphone and uh, and speak, whereas the attendees need to type. I think that's how it that's how it works in a webinar. There is one for Phoebe in in the Q and A from Hugo Rivetti. That's great. Uh, okay, so I'll I'll ask um, in case people can't see the questions. Uh, hello to Hugo first, who I know is joining us from uh, Brazil. Um, so thank you for your interesting paper, Phoebe. You mentioned the importance Williams places on the analysis of individual experiences. Um, Edmund Burke's case, for instance, is what Hugo mentions. Thinking of Williams's voice, do you think there's any relation between this aspect of his approach and the autobiographical records that we can find not only in his novels, but also in some critical writings? I'm thinking of the country and, and the city. Um, so the, the role of, of voice on, on the one hand, which you, which you talked about, uh, Phoebe, and this autobiographical um, uh, dimension, um, almost confessional element of Williams's writing that, that Julian alluded to, is there a connection between those things? Yeah, I think absolutely. And I, I noticed you called that confessional and, and said, Julian, that you would not uh, be encouraging your students to write in that manner yourself. Um, and that's obviously advice I've also received. And I suppose it seems a deliberate effort in Williams to cut against uh, the kind of abstraction of academic discourse or the attempt to elevate yourself to sort of the position of a god in, in writing. Uh, a text that is meant to apply, you know, in sort of a, a law setting um, fashion. But I think it's very interesting that you simultaneously have that kind of slightly godlike voice in the tendency towards kind of abstraction or something a bit more structural that is then like compounded with this more autobiographical kind of thing. Um, and absolutely it's there in the critical writings um, but it just seems that the combination of those two things across some distance is what is maybe interesting about that voice. Um, and a longer version of this paper that I wrote and then had to cut down um, did include this quote from the beginning of the country in the city where he makes that approach towards this kind of inventory, but very much through um, his own experience. And just to read the beginning of it, he writes, but it is, well, it is as well to say at the outset that this has been for me a personal issue for as long as I remember. And then goes on to kind of narrate that um, like original scene. Um, I think there's something in the cadence there that people have found very kind of inviting um, in answer to, in, in some answer to that question, but absolutely, I do think it's common across 
across the works. I mean, it's, it's often seen as a, perhaps a characteristic of contemporary, used broadly, criticism to, to locate oneself um, as a critic, right? Not to assume uh, an all-knowing position of universality. Uh, and Williams, it strikes me, is quite an early example of that, um, with perhaps part, part of the reason for that being um, suggested in both your papers, in, in a way. Um, you know, I think there are implications to the fact that what's often seen as the inaugural text of English cultural studies, culture and society, is actually written by a Welshman, or at least a borderman, however we wish to define Williams, but someone who's able to see that culture almost in anthropological terms from the outside, as opposed to just inhabiting and accepting it as though it's uh, inevitable or, or um, doesn't need to be scrutinized in the way that other cultures perhaps need to. So there's almost you know, the, the, the view of, of English culture from the outside in culture and society that perhaps gives the text its, um, its, its power. Um, any other questions from from the from the floor, please. Um. Hugo's thanking thanking for the for the question. Julian, you said Williams never never met uh, Canetti, um, but presumably they would have known people in common, would they? You know, in, in terms of intellectual, well, Iris Murdoch might be one. She she might be one. Um, I suppose so. I haven't um, thought about that. Um, there must have been uh, people, as you say, that they would have known. Um, he, he doesn't. Uh, uh, n n neither of them uh, uh, alludes to that. I, I mean, it is. Um, uh, a, a one-way relationship to, to an extent. Um, w Williams writes several pages uh, uh, about uh, Canetti. Canetti glad, gladly receives that uh, that praise um, by uh, an eminent uh, figure and, and passes it on. I mean, he wanted recognition. He wanted to uh, establish himself. Um, I suppose with Dylan Thomas, it's slightly in the, it's, it's in the other direction. I don't think Thomas ever re re refers to him anywhere, but. Uh, he uh, refers to Thomas uh, 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 a few times. Um, yes, and, and in, in um, drama from Ibsen to Brecht, Raymond Williams writes about Under Milk Wood. Um, okay, right. So this is perhaps one of his earliest engagements with, with uh, Welsh literature, um, mm -hmm. overtly. Um, and Under Milk, well, from your, from your reading, I mean, there are, there are reasons perhaps why he'd discuss Under Milk Wood in a volume that also discusses uh, Canetti. Mm, mm. Well, well uh, I, I must say that um, drama from Ibsen to Eliot or Ibsen to Brecht has always been, for me, Williams' uh, key text. I can remember it being on the library shelf at my uh, school and uh, dipping into it because uh, of uh, interest in, in Brecht at that, uh, at that stage. Um, I mean, it is quite remarkable in 1952 that he is writing about all these uh, continental uh, dramatists. He is right up to date. I mean, uh, I, I was surprised that he knew Gerhard Hauptmann and Ernst Toller. Um, uh, Pirandello is, is, is there as well. Um, so, I mean, he's, um, he, he's, he, he's quite, he's trying to establish himself, isn't he? And he, he, his own, his own uh, distinct voice. And he's, he's, he's expressing uh, a certain view of, um, of the English uh, dramatic or literary uh, scene in that, um, in, in, in that book. Um, and what he says about um, uh, Singh um, is interesting, surely in the context of uh, Under Milkwood. And um, uh, I found it uh, interesting that um, Thomas's translator, Eric Fried, um, uh, should, um, should say, well, this isn't a road to go down. Um, however, he understood the, the language of uh, Under Milkwood. He, he was uh, a dias diasporic, uh, of Jewish uh, Viennese, he was seventeen in nineteen thirty-eight, and that's a sort of that's a sort of um, a, a, a key age. If if you were 
if he'd been three or four years younger, then I think he would have switched into writing English. But because he was already, uh, he'd already reached that age, he needed to stay with his, uh, his, his original um, language. And he wanted to somehow uh, retain that um, while, while living in, in North London. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I mean, that question of diaspora is, is an interesting one. It takes mm. us back to Phoebe's um, paper. I, was, I guess mm. I was kind of hoping that someone else might ask um, a question just, just regarding perhaps the problematics of thinking of, of Wales in, in terms of these kinds of debates. You know, there, there is a whole debate in, in Welsh cultural studies in relation to the question of, of colonialism, clearly the danger of over-dramatization, uh, the yeah. Welsh as colonists, as part of the British Empire, as, as people who essentially profited from it. Um, and by today, of course, the reality of actual Black Welsh um, you know, that Wales itself is diverse in different ways. So to make the claim that Raymond Williams is like Stuart Hall, you know, it's um, not that you were making that claim, Phoebe, but at its crudest, that, that's how the, the claim can, yeah. can count, can sound. But Stuart yeah. Hall himself is clearly making that connection, isn't he? I mean, he's, he's seeing something in that experience that um, Williams documents that speaks to his experience that allows him to speak. I, I wonder, you know, what, what your feelings are on that as someone working on these issues uh, today? That is, where, where do we place um, an European minority or, or what's controversially perhaps described as an internal colony in relation mm -hmm. to the actual history of Western colonialism? Yeah, I, I you know, would probably try to couch if if this was something that I sh you know redid um I would try to couch it in as tentative terms as possible I do think this is a lens that Stuart Hall is obviously using to work something through about how he relates to this person and and through him to his own experience um and I wouldn't make the claim claiming kind of factual terms that Raymond Williams is a diasporic figure as such I, I think I felt that in terms of the way of he processes his own experience something of that nature is going on here um but obviously as you as you mentioned um you know it's problematic <laughs> uh quote unquote to to state that as a case outright um having said that i think um and i want to kind of buttress this more i think going forward but this 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 famous quote of Stuart Hall's, this kind of enigmatic uh, statement in, in policing the crisis of that race is the modality in which class is lived, I think is um, very interesting, something to chew on, and I think in some way probably mediating his own experience through Williams and seeing the continuities and, and disparities there. He is clearly doing something of the thinking of, you know, what is this thing race? How does it relate to class? Where are these things overlapping? Um, and actually, I know that, Daniel, you um, know Hazel Carby's recent book, Imperial Intimacies, but I think that's also something that she's chewing over um, in that book. I haven't got the quote to hand, but she's talking about the way that regionality is constructed in relation to kind of the supposed center and the, the kind of continuities between those two experiences as being a real point of comparison, if not a kind of identity. Um, so yes, I, you know, I don't think this should be put forward as a kind of watertight case, but, but maybe just as a kind of lens to shine on, on it and, and as a way of thinking about how that relationship was navigated, at least by Hall. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that you know the picture you present is 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 a is a considerably more nuanced one than than, than the famous one made by by Gilroy that essentially sees Williams as um, well an English racist essentially you know he 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 basically equates Williams's position in towards two thousand with Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech which seems um, you know just just kind of kind of exaggerated on the one hand. Um, while on the other, actually ignoring Raymond Williams' own positionality and the fact that he never identified himself as English. Um, so, so, you know, ignoring Williams' hybridity and Hall brings that out from a position um, that has authority, if you like, um, yeah. in terms of these debates. So I think there's a lot more to be, to be explored there. 
I think also in the recent interview that I quoted, and I think you've mentioned in, in previous years of the interview between Paul Gilroy and Sandra, Sandra Bangstad, he does almost present that case as though he was trying to identify the ways that those arguments could be exploited by the right or the, the way that those there's continuities between those two things without necessarily saying that Williams himself was advancing that position. And then going back to there ain't no black in the Union Jack, it's, it's not quite uh, kind of articulated in that way. Um, so, you know, I do see why there's been resistance. Um, having said that, I, you know, I do, I do think one of the things that Hall points out in, in Williams's work um, as a problem in that, in that essay, Our Mongol Selves, is this euphemistic quality um, when he comes to talking about questions of race and imperialism. Um, I think the phrase that Williams uses, others who are more visibly different. Um, and Hall kind of takes that and, and forces the actual uh, you know, word that should be there, which is like black people. Um, and I guess in, in a way, I wonder whether that was something that um, Henry Louis Gates was coming up against when he met Raymond Williams. There's almost a, a lack of vocabulary, which is obviously a reflection of his formation, the time in which he lived and all the rest of it. But, I, you know, I do sympathise with, you know, these thinkers who are drawing attention to that, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. A lack of vocabulary. Yeah, and that vocabulary yeah. is developing at the time, isn't it? Um, and perhaps by today, we're able to look back at Raymond Williams deploying some of that uh, vocabul vocabulary back upon him uh, in, yeah. in a way. Um, great. I, I can't see any, any questions coming through unless um, I just seem to be juggling several little screens on my, uh, on my computer. I don't know whether anyone else sees anything there. Um, after lunch, um, Julian, we'll be hearing from Harold from... Um, Berlin and um, from uh, Professor Werner Sollers, who is one of the central figures really in developing precisely that kind of language that Phoebe is, is talking about. And um, I mean, in some ways, my attempts to, to, to explain or explore Williams's um, Welshness was, was to read some of uh, Werner's concepts, not least consent and descent, back into Raymond Williams's um, thinking but but you know as a professor of german julian but also you know you mentioned Siebold and, and austerlitz um which has a whole first section in in, in wales so that idris parry connection is, is is interesting in relation to to Siebold. i wonder whether you'd like to just say something about williams as welsh europeanism in terms of your own understanding of it from as you said our initial discussions about does that have a greater meaning than just a kind of metaphoric description? Um, and I would just, the conclusion was it, it, it does because he's engaging with, with European modernism from the very beginning and retains that interest that comes through then in his interest in um, European Marxism in the, in the 70s. Um, just any general thoughts on locating Raymond Williams in that kind of European context? Well, uh, I, I, I was feeling the need five minutes ago to start ventriloquizing uh, our absent friend, Dan Gerke. Um, uh, um, I mean, his, his project was on, on, on the European Marxism and he, he picked uh, 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 Lukács, uh, Gramsci and uh, Sartre, if I remember uh, correctly, and uh, went through in, in, in some detail how um, Williams absorbed uh, their ideas as they came through. Um, we we did come to the conclusion that he was comfortable reading French. I, I don't know whether Merrin would would confirm that, um, but that was that was um, a conclusion that we reached, I think, or or, or, or Dan reached. Um, he was called the British Lukash, which wouldn't necessarily have been meant as a compliment. Uh, I don't think uh, after the mid fifties, at least Lukash was associated with rather intolerant and totalitarian uh, views, though he was very avant-garde in, um, in his youth in the, in the 1920s, uh, up to and including the, the big work, uh, History and Class Consciousness, which was the one I think that was um, important for the development of, uh, of Williams um, Marxism. Um, uh, Marxist thought is um, is not something which usually is uh, developed on on these islands, is it? I can remember a conservative uh, political uh, 
broadcast in the 1987 election, which identified ideologies as, as alien to you know, the English or the British. They were imported from uh, abroad. Um, and uh, Raymond Williams was someone who was uh, doing that, uh, importing and uh, adapting and transforming and uh, domesticating. Um, so certainly um, there, I was, I was hoping that there would be a bigger connection. Um, I was hoping to say the Jews and the Welsh, and uh, I could just come up with um, really quite banal comments uh, uh, on, on, on that. And I didn't want to uh, make um, those, um, but there is certainly, um, an, an interest which is there right from the beginning in, in drama from Ibsen to uh, Eliot in um, in stuff which is translated and the way that he um, he's ready to domesticate or to auto da fe he says novels published in English he doesn't say written in English but published in English and here's this one that it counts just the same because it's it's published in English I'm not going to exclude it because it's a translation uh, it exists in English C V Wedgwood. Um, uh, so it, it's it's just as important. Yeah, uh, the um, Zebald connection uh, it just occurred to me uh, last night. Uh, Zebald uh, uh, arrives in England, age twenty-two, in nineteen sixty-six, and he is uh, a lector uh, working at Manchester University. That is, he's teaching the German language. He stays there for four years before taking up his uh, post at uh, in Norwich, the University of uh, East Anglia, where he stayed until his uh, death. Um, he got to Manchester and um, one of the first people he met was, was, was a landlord who um, was a German emigre, that is he was someone who had, had been uh, German and been uh, expelled or fled the, the Nazis and that was the first Jewish person he'd ever met and um, that experience was uh, foundational for um, Seibart and he writes about it in a fictionalised form in his novel The, the, the Emigrants. Um, and, and yes, Austerlitz is, uh, is all about this uh, little boy who um, comes on a, a kinder transport and um, is adopted then by um, a Welsh uh, family in North Wales. And um, he's, they're not interested in his past. He, he has to assume a, a, an entirely new um, uh, identity. That's one thing which comes across very strongly in Austerlitz and the whole novel is about uncovering his past and his 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 previous uh, 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 identity um, but there is that um, uh, passage about um, floods and um, uh, that, that Zebelt picks up I mean that the flooded valleys and so forth uh, you know, he's a rather gloomy character uh, Zebelt um, there, there was some irony in his early work but it, it, it's there's not much left by the time of Austerlitz so it's all about ruins and, and collapse and uh, he, he, he does um, deal with the um, the Welsh reservoirs in that connection. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, the, the movement of people out of, of areas, um, right, right, right. Case mm -hmm. being Trover in, in, in Wales, where, where a Welsh language community is removed and is offered relocation in, in, in well, various places, including Liverpool, in order to build a reservoir for, for cities in the English Midlands, essentially, which, of course, becomes sort of a galvanizing symbol for, for Welsh nationalism. But, but Sable seems to pick up on, on some of the resonances of, of that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And um, well, the, the, I mean, I think there are some com comparisons that could be made just just in terms of the fiction between some of these writers. But what, what, what the basis for that comparison would be? Um, yeah, is, is, is a, well, I think you're, you're starting to map out maybe a context for that. Maybe to end the session, I mean, you, you mentioned, Julian, um, that we came to the conclusion that um, Raymond could certainly um, understand French and had some written French because there are notes in the uh, papers of, a, of his attending a, a lecture by Bourdieu. Uh, and um, in, in Raymond Williams's hand, he's making notes in French on the, on the lecture. Uh, and uh, Bordier's notion of the habitus and so forth has parallels in, in Raymond Williams's thought. 
Um, in relation to what you've been listening to, Marion, I wonder if we could turn to you. Firstly, on, on that question, I mean, what, what were Raymond Williams's linguistic abilities? But secondly, I mean, yourself, you're, you're brought up um, in, in England. Does it make any sense to speak of the family as, a, as in some ways diasporic? I mean, was Williams's Welshness ever communicated to you as children? Or was that not really an identity that, um, that's, that meant much as you were growing up? He certainly did speak French. We often spent camping holidays in France. Um, well, uh, my brothers and I were all given Welsh names, actually, <coughs> which we've struggled with ever since, actually, in their inner Cornish. And we visited my grandmother um, in Lumbershire. Um, I think basically in his later years, um, he, he lived part of the time in Craswell in the Black Mountains uh, and did in fact briefly join the Welsh Nationalist Party quite probably. Uh, and he was very upset really that people voted against devolution in uh, whichever year it was. Yeah, 79. Yeah, right. Uh, because you've, I mean, you've retained um, a connection with with Wales, Merrin, and um, you know, not, not just in terms of the papers, but as a poet, you published in Poetry Wales and uh, New Welsh Review and so forth, and um, have been long listed for the uh, Book of the Year Prize and so forth. So, yeah, um, you know, there the clearly is that is that connection then, uh, which you've which you've continued yourself and. and that the papers are located in, in Swansea, which one occasionally hears people grumbling about. <laughs> but, uh, we're, we're very, very pleased, very, very pleased to have them. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you both. Thanks, uh, Phoebe and, and Julian for, for an excellent opening session.